right. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, my name is C.S. Rajan, and I'm one of the teachers in the national board system of being training postgraduates for their DNB in surgery. One of the requirements of the course for both university-based and national board-based studies is the production of a small amount of personal work, which was referred to as the thesis. Now, thanks to this coronavirus, another CS, the corona syndrome that it came in, sitting idle, my mind was wondering how I can make it into a systematic form so that people can follow the steps of getting through this thesis process properly. And as my habit happens that I use a little bit of play of words and try and use my initials to describe each of the steps, I found I was very successful in getting CS terms for every one of the steps involved. And so I put it together and I shared this with Dr. Pata and he said, no, uh, doctor, this should be nice for the students. So I am presenting this for you as the first time. Please bear with me with the monotony of the word C and S. But believe me, if you follow the order, they will take you through the whole thesis process in a very systematic way from, uh, from the beginning to the very end. So thank you, Dr. Pata, for having me. Uh, with that little introduction, I will start. <coughs> this is a step-by-step -step guide on what is the code of study, the code that you need to follow to get complete success in fulfilling this curriculum requirement of the thesis. Uh, um, there's a little confusion on the words thesis and dissertation. Both are used interchangeably across the world. There's no any fixed place where any word uh, is preferred. The key difference by the dictionary is when they are completed. A thesis is a project that marks the end of a degree program, whereas a dissertation is any study during that program during a particular time of the study. Since this thesis is part of submission along with your examination results for the award of your degree, this study is going to be referred to as a thesis and we shall use that word to describe what we have to, what we are talking about. I have brought this uh, C and S as my initials. I don't know if those who have followed me. I've written the CS for intercostal drains. I've written a CS for empyma. I've written a CS for communication skills. Like that, I have this habit of trying to get it into the CS formats to get a kind of an interest in reading and, and allow you to think about each CS as you go along. It's congratulations and smiles for the successful entry into surgical postgraduate training. It's going to lead to your certification in surgery, either it's university-based MS or it is the national board-based DNB. This is a very mundane and dull subject. This is following two excellent lectures, one on GERD and another on the advances in parotid surgery, which were before mine. Those were clinically important. They were very relevant to daily activity. But please remember that it is this thesis work that gets you through to your degrees. It's an important step that is necessary. So kindly do not treat it as a chore. Kindly make, pay attention to it. And who knows that that research or that little work you do may be the first step of you developing into some other form of research or activity that will be your interest across your career. It takes 40 steps. There are 40 steps in getting this thesis done. And this is to help the cub surgeon, that is the young surgeon like you. It is open to all specialities. In fact, I've written to a few of my friends from other specialities also to join in. This topic is about the thesis, it's not only on the subject. And the words that I'm going to use involve the counselor senior, that is the guide, who will also have to cooperate and carry out satisfactorily 
this important aspect of postgraduate studies, which is called the thesis. So let's start. Step number one, begin early. You are the young postgraduate. You need to meet the concerned mentor and seek his wise counsel. Don't wait for time. There is that little diffidence. There is that hesitation. And believe me, your biggest roadblock is your senior. The immediate senior, one year your senior, will give you all kinds of reasons to delay the start of your, of your dissertation work, uh, thesis work. You start early and for heaven's sake, as you go senior, please encourage your juniors also to start early so that this is, becomes an enjoyable exercise and not something that is a pain. You need to choose a subject or a topic. Um, this will be based on the suggestions and advice from the guide. And on you going through a list of the recently done topics and the topics that have been covered in the institution and in that board or university, you need to choose a subject that doesn't get very repetitive or has been done recently. The going through the lists at the universities and at the national board will help you not only come to a kind of topic of interest, but also avoid something that has been recently done. Once you have narrowed down on a particular topic, say I'm going to study on varicose veins and something to do with varicose veins, um, new radio frequency ablation versus open surgery, whatever. You have to conduct a search of the literature. You have to search the literature to see what all you can go and read that is relevant to that particular subject. Pick two or three studies that have been done already on the subject. We are not doing earth shattering new research. We are just trying to put in an application of some study that has already been done into our situation. So you pick these studies and go through and you can use these studies as your reference points. Your study, what you've got in your findings, you can compare with these two. Make sure that at least one of these studies is Indian. When you read these studies, you will find some gap, some lacuna, some little aspect of information you could probably add. So an example would be the, uh, the um, role of BMI in the development of varicose veins and the response to treatment. Look for a lacuna, see if somebody has studied that. Or look for the sitting occupation being related to varicose veins. We all know it is a standing occupation disease, but sometimes you're surprised, you'll find tailors coming with it, you'll find some other people who have a sitting occupation. So you could try and see if occupational uh, incidence makes a difference in the data that is available. Once you have done that, you've narrowed your field onto the subject of your choice, you have to create what is called a research question. You have to constitute a selective research question. This is an important step that will define the uniqueness of your study. It will give you a problem that you will seek to address or find a solution by the study that is to follow. And it should be acceptable and of some interest. You have your question of the whole topic. You narrow it down a little bit. You further narrow it to a comparison and then you'll strike the light and find out, ha, ah, let me just see what the effect of my particular intervention or my particular interest is on the topic that I have chosen. A brief word about the research question is that it is a question that is a, a, an answerable inquiry into a concern or issue and is the very first step of a research project. <coughs> It is the first act that you do of the research project. So this needs a little thought. It needs a little guidance. Please talk to your mentor, your guide, and get your first question to be the proper one so for which you will base your study. <coughs> there are three types of research questions. It could be just a descriptive research question. You're going to describe a process that is going through. Or it could be competitive, where you have two different interventions that are being planned and you compare one with the other. Or it could be an intervention which is causal, that is, you do something and see the effect on the patient. 
So these are the different types of research questions that could develop from the topic you have chosen. Very important now is to confirm that it can be done. You must make sure that the topic can be done and can be solved, is feasible in two aspects. One is the resources on the, and facilities in the hospital and two, the economics of the study, both in terms of cost to the institution and cost to the subject. Some tests, some subjects, you need to do a very costly investigation. Who's going to bear that cost? Is it the institution or do you go get the, the patient to bear it? So you have to look at the economics of how much this study is going to cost. And secondly, very importantly, check the incidence and the prevalence of that clinical condition so that you have sufficient patient numbers for the past four to five years so that you will have enough population to study your subject and uh, the subject within the time frame of your PG studies. Once this is done, you need to set down your aims and objectives. Generally, it is a single aim and there are three or four objectives that are formulated to help you achieve that aim. The aim being is what of the study and the objective is how of the study. Again, going back to my varicose vein sto story uh, subject, if we want the aim is to subject to see the effect of radio frequency wave ablation versus open surgery in BMIs over 30 or 35. The objective is to see the clinical symptomatology, the presentation, the investigation values, as well as the uh, <coughs> intervention, time of intervention, post-operative periods, and also the recovery periods. Man hours lost from work and things like that. So all those can come into your objectives, but your single aim would be to compare these two in this particular population. This will also give you the title of your subject. I'm going to be studying this, and that will kind of give you a better focus. Once you've done that, you have to find out how you're going to go about it. And this is done by the components and schemes of the materials and methods. This needs to be followed as how you're going to do the process. It is the working plan by which you will do your study, the uh, materials that you need, the interventions, the, uh, so the uh, equipment that is necessary, and the other ancillaries that go into making the study. This is where we all make a mistake. We leave the statistician out. We must go and meet the statistician immediately and talk to him. The statistician is the most vital person in a study, especially for us medicals who have a very poor background knowledge of statistics. The statistician will look at your idea your aim and your objective, and he will look at the instance and prevalence and come up with some calculations to give you a sample size, how many people you need to be study to make this an effective study. He will also give you appropriate scoring and rating scales for you to collect your data. Three point rating scale, five point rating scale, some kind of a scale that will tell you when you collect data, you're able to rate it, you're able to quantify the effect. This correct sample of population is calculated by the statistical formula. It's not only the number, but the duration of the study. Is it a fixed period study or is it a study of so, till so many numbers are achieved? All that is to be decided and will be noted. The correct inclusion and exclusion criteria need to be put down so that you know what all comes into your population and what all are not in your population. I often find PGs collecting data from patients that are outside their study and then trying to fit them into the study saying that, ha, huh, this is also, I did this case, sir, I did that case. So, so it, you must be very careful on knowing your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the guide, as well as the statistician is very important at this stage to offer the initiation of the study. Then you create your pro forma, you have to collect your data. This is called the data sheet. It must be planned and appropriate and have appropriate boxes to tick and spaces for entry of data. 
sometimes you find the whole sheet written down in one page, but no boxes. You find the whole sheet written without space to describe the operative procedure or the findings. And then it is difficult for you to collect the data and that frustrates you. So if you make a proper uh, <coughs> a data collection sheet or pro forma, the survey sheet will be very comfortable in your collection data. And just make sure the statistician casts his eyes on it and the guide finds out and agrees with it. All interventions, all things are on patients. And so we need consent and we need to have an informed consent, a consent to, to confirm sanction of being part of this study. So this is also an important aspect. It should be written down and you should be able to get the signature and consent of the patients before for their participation in this study. Now, all these have one big element, as I mentioned earlier, the cost. And sometimes companies will come up with the idea, I will give you the medicine, you do the study. It's a commercial sponsorship. Now, if you have commercial sponsorship, like I had a situation where a particular mesh was asked to be introduced for inguinal hernia repair, comparing it with another type of mesh. And the company was very willing to bear the cost of the mesh. Now, you have to be a little careful here because there is a huge conflict of interest. And the source of funding should be mentioned and you should be, people should know that this is the why, the reason you're doing the study and try and declare it at the beginning. Why you declare it at this point is because when the hospital ethics boards go through your proposal, which is the next step, they will be able to give you the sanction to go through for this kind of a study. Points one to 12 now constitute the protocol. And this has to conform to standards. And this is called the proposal of study. And you write it up. First 12, I will be giving at the end a brief on how you write a protocol. And submit it to the hospital ethics board and the academic board of your department who will review all this and give their sanction or approval for you to conduct the study. Please note, all these things take time. It doesn't happen in one day. You'll get pushed around, you get come today, come tomorrow, oh, we are meeting later, oh, we are meeting here. There are various reasons why these excuses come up. I'm not finding fault with them, but the process is such that you need to show some amount of commitment and determination to get your project started. If you don't do that in time, you find yourself short of time. Remember your PG courses are 36 months in an ideal situation. Very often your admissions are late and exams come early, it's even less. Your periods of study are between 12 months and 18 months. Uh, if you don't start early enough, you will not get enough time for you to collect enough data for it to be a useful study. So there should be an element of your persistence and your effort in trying to get the thesis work started. Once you've done the protocol, you can kind of relax in the sense, ha, huh, I am on the railway track. I just need to move from station A to station B. And this is the time where we collect the data. It is a real part of the data, its collection. Please note it will be slow initially because you're not used to the performer. You take unnecessary details. You're not sure how you collect the data. But over the process of time, as your numbers progress, you will find a pattern emerging and you'll be able to collect the data into your performer sheets correctly. You have to carefully and serially record the data into the performer. Related pictures and illustrations may be taken as they happen, but you must retain confidentiality and protect identity of patient. So all this happens simultaneously. An interesting case comes a varicose ulcer in the case that we are referring to. You take a nice uh, picture of it, make sure that the patient's identity is hidden. So too, when you use investigations, make sure that there is a black mark on the name of the patient, which is often on the radiograph or on the, radi the illustrations that are used from the radiology imaging sections. Everything needs effort. India didn't become a strong army without training. 
Rahul Dravid did become a good batsman without effort. You got to put in that effort. And that effort is personal. It is a committed striving. It is makes the whole dissertation easy. All you got to be is sincere and regular. Set aside time, either every day, that is asking a bit too much, but at least once a week to pick up and collect your data. This committed striving is the effort. And that effort is what ultimately results in a useful uh, study. Interact with the guide. You need constant supervision by the guide. The guide will help you not only to find solutions to day-to-day -day problems, they give you advice, they support you in your, in your work, they make sure your quality of the work is good. And of course, because they're having an eye, it keeps you honest so that you're not bluffing. Very many PGs collect all the data over the last week and bluff and introduce untruths and make the whole thing a farce. Kindly be honest. Remember, you have a conscience to answer. And if you do it honestly, and if the guide is regularly checking the periodic reviews, which is a mandated duty of the department and the guide, will help you to get an honest figure. This actually helps in what is called the thesis experience. When you find that you don't have to manipulate data, when you find that you're doing it according to what is method, method that you want have to do it by, it becomes enjoyable. It becomes something that you like to do. You're going to be studying a particular topic. So you need to concomitantly study on that topic. You need to know everything about varicosinates from the etiology, from the purpose, from a, a, the um, clinical presentations to the classifications, to the interventions, so that you know all details of subject. And when you go through the concern, all the available literature, this will form the basis from which you can infer from your study. Without knowing what the background of the subject is, how will you get your inferences? So you need to do the inferences by a proper look at the subject. The whole subject should be known to you properly. At this stage, you can commence scripting. That is writing of your part one. Part one is written in your own language. You have to understand certain issues because you must know what is ownership of information. You must know the implications of copyright. You must know the costs of information. These are all little things that creep in. Costs of information are now covered because most libraries are digital and are available for students at low cost or free connections. The ownership of the information, you must make sure that there is no copyright objectionable statements there if it is such is being used for uh, reference, the proper reference should be given down and you cannot borrow that information and put it into your study. A very strict no-no, curb strictly, this attempt to cut, copy and paste. In some ways, I'm happy that I did my dissertation 30, 40 years ago where I had to write it out. It was handwritten and that handwritten pages were given for submission for correction. And finally, we had only one typewriter to type out the whole thing. It was a big chore. Today, you have computers, you have word processors, and you have cut, copy, and paste. Now, for heaven's sake, don't do that, please. Because today we have, as guides and as seniors, I'm also part of on the board of the National, of the Indian Journal of Surgery and the editorial board. We just have to put in a review of literature software and we get the words out. Similar words are picked out, similar sentences are picked out, and in no time we can make out that this has been copied from so-and-so article and put down here above that. So please try to avoid that. So no cut, copy, paste. Now you need to sort out the data, the data that you have collected for, from statistical analysis from the performer. You have to go back to the guide and say, what do I put into this? What do I put into that table? and they will give you, it's not a very difficult thing. You can do it on your own also. You need to create a few tables, age incidents, uh, symptoms incidents, the findings, the preoperative assessments, you know, create various little tables that are, are created for the analysis. 
Here again, we use a lot of statistics. The statistician is very important. It helps to break down the data for analysis. And the student must also know and comprehend the statistical package that is going to be used in the breakdown of data. There are various softwares available. And it's nice that the statistician does it, but you must know what information is being extracted from the data so that you will understand what you have to write and describe. It involves an incomprehension of medical statistics. And for this, I feel that every student should buy a small basic book of medical statistics and read it and learn. Part of the dissertation work is to make sure that you also are benefiting from the process and knowing about medical statistics. Every article, every journal that you read, the data is presented in statistical form. And unless you know this data, unless you know the break, breakdown of this kind of data, you will not understand articles. And you can never critique an article. An article. Journal reviews, journal criticisms are all based on what you learn during your thesis process. And it is this thesis process that helps you in your career. It is important. These are little bits of information that people don't talk about when they do the dissertation. And that is why it is a often looked down upon chore. But actually, it does a lot for you. You learn how to collect data, you learn how to put it into statistical forms, you know how to interpret these statistics, and this kind of interpretations can be taken forward into your career. Charts and sketches, yes, this is one thing every PG likes to do. You go and put in all these various colorful things. If you go into a Microsoft Excel package, it's very nicely, you can put all these graphs, make it colored and all that. Yeah, they're nice, it looks nice, but make sure the charts and sketches give you correct and appropriate data. The data, the inference that comes out must be proper. Once you've got this data down, you have to search the data. You have to analyze the data. You have to look and see what facts are emerging. BMI is less than 30, spend five days in the hospital. BMI is more than 30, are spending six days in the hospital. Is it significant? Is it going to be made bigger or worse for the treatment interference? These are the ways in which you look at the emerging data. And you need to take this data that's coming and relate it to your primary aim of the study and the objectives by which how you are going to do the study. Once you've got all these data together, you have to create significance. You have to run through a few of the correlations and significance values. You must find a p-value for many things. Today, of course, people are questioning the importance of p-values and how figures are adjusted to get p-values. It all stems from the fact that basically there's a certain amount of dishonesty. Of course, they say there are three types of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. You can always vary your statistics to get information to, your, to suit yourself. Try to be honest, as honest as possible. And make sure that the significance agrees and it works with your aims and objectives of your study. Now comes what is called the discussion, what I have written down as comprehensive siftings. You have to see, compare your work with so-and-so study of India, so-and-so study of uh, a urban population, so-and-so study at a university, and if necessary, even a few studies from abroad. When you look for studies from abroad, you'll get studies from you know, some countries like Turkey, or Korea, and other places where they would have done a lot of work on a particular topic. And you have to be a little careful in interpreting because their socioeconomic um, presentations are different from ours and we cannot directly offer comparison. So it's better to compare with previous. <clears throat> the discussion is over. You'll find out the differences that will help you to get your points of view about your aim and your objectives. Once you've got all these things down, you need to write down your conclusions that this is the way we down in relation to the aim. What were the conclusions? One, two, three. In relation to the objectives, extra information that came in from the study. And 
based on these things, provided they match the aim and objective, you can formulate a few recommendations and tell so that is part of your study that will tell people that this is what my study has resulted. These are the findings, so I can give you a few recommendations. Only now, after you proceeded and got down to this level, do you begin to write your second part. The second part of the dissertation is written out now, is the whole process of how you collected data, put it down into figures, analyzed it, discussed it, and came up with the solutions. Another thing that gives a lot of trouble to people is the references. References must be composed serially. It's a tedious task. Each piece of work that is cited by you will get a unique number. You have to arrange it in the order of citation. And if you use the text, it, it, the uh, reference two or three times, use the same number each time and always write the number down as a small superscript so that it's alongside and that should match your uh, reference list. Now that reference list is put together in what I call compile and stack. It's the bibliography, the whole bibliography. We have the lovely Canadian system. It's a referring example. Uh, Vancouver referring example, and that is used as the standard. It's most often uh, not done properly. Many evaluators look at a thesis and look at the references. Have they written the references properly? And have they relate to the um, superscript given in the first or the second part of that reference? Now, if that is wrong, it leads to thesis rejection. It means you may have done a study well, but you're not careful in putting it down in proper order and system. Surgery is also something that is done in proper order and system. Unless you are having some discipline in how you do things on the surface, how will you have discipline when you're doing your surgical work? You need to develop these kind of little acts of discipline so that you become better ultimately as a surgeon. Concerning snaps, I've already mentioned that you need to number them. You need to write a proper descriptive legend and insert it into the appropriate pages. It relates to both first part and second part. And that you need to be very, very strict on confidentiality. Confidentiality supreme, especially with illustrations, is an important thing. The patient's identity to be never to be revealed. And this goes through for the illustrations used from subjects for the study. After you've done all this, you realize, oops, there are a few things, there are some limitations. My period of follow-up is not big enough. My population was not the ideal population. I had a bias in the selection of patients. And so these will add relevance to your study if you can put your constraints and strictures, the limitations of the study, the limitations with which you have come up with these references. The whole dissertation revolves around the abstract. It's when you've written a proper abstract, which comes in the front of the dissertation, that the evaluator, the person who reads the dissertation, gets the interest to read the rest of the dissertation. It is very key to get the attention of the evaluator and the assessor, and the intention is so that they are get their attention to see what they can learn from the subject. And that is the parameters, useful parameters of uh, assessment. You can also pick out a few keywords and keep it because in case you need to publish it, these will be the words by which you can get the publications in. Surprisingly, I've written the introduction now at the end of the study. Yes, there will be an introduction in the beginning in your part one when you submit your protocol. Sometimes it's necessary to revise it a little bit in light of the findings that you have come and modify your introduction statement, not change your aims and objectives, please no. Modify your introduction statement so that you give the background of the study more clear and the people are able to read it and understand. It's best written at the end and is the 
but is the first page of the study. It should evoke the interest in the reader to want to go through the whole study. Corrections and scrutiny. Here comes the run around. You submit it. These are the corrections. I want to see it again before you submit it. You make more editions. You change again, write another draft. You get more corrections and it comes. To, yes, it keeps going on and on, but it's not an endless cycle. Once you're able to correct it and get the inference properly, because remember the senior is guiding you by his vast experience, his ability to make sure that the data is, is being presented properly. It's also his responsibility because he's the guide. His name will be involved in question if it is not correct. So there is a little bit of a run around. Unfortunately, personality bias and interests do click in here. I would like you to maintain a cool composure and a calm head and get this thing done properly. There is a long discussion that is involved with the academic boards of the departments and they will give you the relevance of the study, the approval of the findings of the study, and a formal acceptance of the study. Once this is done, this goes through for a little up and down, batting keeps going on, you have to take quite a few runs, no boundaries here, you have to go through the process of building up the approval. Only now will you go to the printer and binder. You must choose the correct font, line spacing, margins as dictated by the control body. You have to proofread. There will be typographical and topographical errors. Don't be in a hurry to take that final printout and then put in inter, inter changes with the pen. That does not look neat. The book has to be bound. You form the certification pages, the guide, uh, and for, for the guide and the institution, acknowledgements, please acknowledge all those who have helped you. You have to find the appendages as the pro forma as an appendage and your master data collection sheet should be all entered at the end. All these bind together to give you a volume. My general instruction is that a good dissertation is between 80 to 100 pages, nothing more. Please do not produce voluminous data, voluminous uh, dissertations. If you find your discussions are taking a lot of time, reduce your first part. Reduce the inferences that you need. That are, use only those part of the that of the first part that is necessary for your inferences of the second part. Check all statutes are met. You know your controlling body says I want it in this format. I want this. I want that. And uh, uh, all these things have to be done properly. The National Board is pretty strict on all these statutes being maintained. I am a corrector or I evaluate dissertations and I find that these statutes sometimes don't get written and met and then we have to ask for clarifications and corrections. You have to go to the chief for the signatures. This is the final approval. This is the last but one step that is necessary. You go to the department, go to the guide, go to the head of institution, get the signatures and seals because that certifies that this is genuine conduct by the student as well as the place and location of the study. So that gives you the value to the study. Complete stipulations, you have to pay some forms and pay some fees. Please fill these forms out properly. Some bodies, especially National Board, ask for the same thing in an electronic format. So you have to make a CD of the whole thing in the proper way in which you've written it out, the same things come out in a CD format, and that has to be sent. Delays in acceptance often relate to these steps. You have not paid the fees, the receipt number is wrong, you have not sent in a CD, or the CD is not opening, and you have some silly reasons why the student's uh, uh, dissertation gets delayed in evaluation. And you must be very vigilant at this step. Imagine after all that effort, you finally go and goof it up at this point is not in your favor. Clock submission, please submit before time. Do not miss the deadline. When dissertations reach after the deadline, they get put into a shelf by some clerk, some person who's in administrative duties and it gets mixed up and it gets lost. And you find that the 
uh, desertation is not sent for evaluation. You need to retain the speed post tracking numbers and other acknowledgements of submission until you finally get the acceptance of the thesis. And you must avoid this deadline. Last minute, hurry up, no sleep, more errors, more difficulties, rejection by the boss, coming back and doing it, it becomes quite a mental torture. You have to make sure that this is done so that you benefit as well as the process has not hurt you mentally. A properly scripted thesis will bring credit to the guide and department as it gets to the student. The same can be taken forward for presentations at meetings and publications as articles. And always remember a good um, dissertation or thesis is a credit point or credit score in your curriculum vitae, in your CV. So your curriculum summary can include your dissertation work. On the other hand, if you do not have conformity and substance, conversely or vice versa, it can get rejected and it can come back for correction and you lose six months of time and it adds to your frustration. Your friends have gone ahead and you have got stuck on this. There is a little importance in submitting in time and getting it cleared properly. Perfection consists in not in extraordinary things, but doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. Just do these simple tasks, do these 40 steps, take it easy. I give you my good wishes and my salutations for all of you all to do it well. Good luck in your thesis process. I hope this little talk has helped you. It will be available on the Facebook website. You can take it down. <coughs> this is the way in which the protocol has to be written a short 10 to 12 pages of stuff. This is the details by which you do it. Please remember, lot, bottom line, there's grammar. There's a lot of importance to the English that is used in the um, material of the discussion and the, uh, the write-up. The chapter format in general, how you make the whole book. In part one, what are the topics that need to be put in? This review of literature, histological chronology and related anatomy, physiology, clinical aspects need to be written, but should be brief. It should not be exhaustive. And the third part is written mainly with everything that relates to the study, the results that you've got, the conclusions that have come, the recommendations that you put forward and a properly scripted bi bibliography. The bibliography, please follow the Canadian style. It is the Vancouver system where you have multiple references, where the names come first, the title of the papers next, the journal, the year of publication, the edition, and the page numbers in a sequence so that you do not miss it. Today we have electronic forms of data. So that also has a particular format. You need to follow this and write down the appropriate website from which you take it. Follow the order, it's there all over the net. Everybody has it, you can do it. <coughs> the references, this is my references for the art, for writing up these things. These are people that, there's one evidence-based surgery and research methodology. It's a primer written by Dr. Lakshman and Dr. Ram Krishna. Very nice for you to write down your dissertation and produce evidence-based surgical work. There are guides to writing our dissertation available on the net. And Dr. Ramakrishna's little book on medical statistics for beginners is also a useful uh, adjunct to the dissertation studies. Manish Paul is a good personal friend of mine. I had had personal communications with him. He is an administrative gentleman and he helped me to write down a few of these things. Thank you for this patient hearing. I hope I've not bored you stiff with the number of CSs this evening. The final list of all the CSs is here in this place. Thank you and good night. I'm available for questions. Um, I'll see what Dr. Pata has to say now. That's it. 
wonderful lecture sir and <laughs> so, i really i mean uh, uh, so magnetic and uh, you know the your diction your uh, uh, vocabulary and the cs everywhere it made a lot of sense thank you so much for such yes. a wonderful lecture uh, the students if any one of you want to ask a question or anyone wants to make a comment please anyone the chat yeah, box a long time not rajesh hi hey, rajesh how are you i'm fine sir <laughs> tell me congratulations sir also is cs sir oh good evening uh, sir good evening sir sir i have a question sir yeah what happens if i am a pg and then i press, i put that it should not happen but suppose i uh, submitted the thesis yes and then you as a uh, evaluator find that the topic is useless uh relevance of topic and the importance is it is important but the actual thesis does not relate to finding something really new or extraordinary okay. if the process has been gone through properly it may be a useless topic the you know the no, i i just give you an off hand example sir yeah 100, 100 cases of cervical lymphadenopathy i do a thesis yes it's very well done but will you accept it sir no i won't but what is that 100 what did you do in that 100 what was exactly. your no, no that what i am trying to say is if that gets rejected as a pg what do i do sir no you have to redo the formatting sir that's all 100 cases is your sample your topic is cervical lymph node in that what has been your specific aim and what are your objectives relationship of uh, fnac versus open biopsy or size of node related to ultrasound finding something you have to break it down into something so that you are using those 100 cases to extract some information the exactly. way in which you do it and how you put aims and objectives into that that is why raising the research question setting up your first research question is very primary you can't say i'm going to do 100 cases cervical lymph node in that what are you trying to do what question are you going to put in why does the patient after fnac take longer to have resolution of lymph nodes than if i do a open biopsy and start att so or specific treatment so some kind of a research point some kind of a research fraction should be extracted made the question and that is the aim and ability so yeah it is 100 cases of cervical lymph node relating to fnac versus anti tuberculous therapy duration something like that and then you get get it gets uh, through i hope that answers you rajesh yes sir very well yes sir <laughs> any any other comment or uh, yeah ashok sir uh, can you hear me now Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, what are the main points over which uh, the thesis are uh, mostly rejected? Yeah, these are the four or five minor points. The first is the aim and objectives are not clearly stated in the beginning. It's very generalized. You have to narrow it down to a specific topic, and that is the why of the study aim, and the objectives are the how you're going about it. second the in the data collection you are collecting data not related to the aims and objectives like in the cervical lymph node case that was just discussed you are collecting data as to socio economic status and um, uh, height of the patient and some other silly things when you are actually concentrating only on the intervention of the uh, on the patient so the what work you do does not match your aims and objectives third when you've done your analysis you find that the uh, inferences and conclusions totally are different from your aims and objectives so that is the mismatch they are not concentrating on the same topic that they wanted to do the study on and so it gets into trouble for further evaluation and lastly the procedure the way in which you've written your references sequencing and the points in which you have taken out is the uh, points that are looked at so every evaluator will read four things first he'll read the abstract secondly he'll read the introduction third he'll read the aims and objectives then he'll flip the whole dissertation through and look in the findings and see 
if the aims and objectives have been answered by this dissertation. If they look like they're being answered, then he'll go back and he'll evaluate every page. But if it's not answered, there's every chance that he'll say, no, this is not answering the question that has been posed. So this needs to be revised or redone and he'll send it back. So this is how we evaluate it. This is how I've been doing it. And it's been reasonably successful. The number of patients and the dissertations that I have rejected are very few, but I have sent them back for corrections and told them how to get it done properly. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any any other question, comment from the audience? <laughs> then no question, sir. Thank you so much for spending yeah, time on you. learning general surgery. We would like to see more of you in the days to come. Yes, sir. I will come in. I'll come in with more clinical topics. This is a yeah. little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Have a nice you. Evening.